Well, good morning, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the opening session, the comments from Dr. Linder and, and also from Rank, Frank Reisberman. Uh, it was, uh, I think, a great way to kick off the, the conference. I want to say a little bit about this panel and its purpose. I'm a big believer that if we're going to take on these challenges and develop solutions, then it's going to come from great partnership, great collaboration. That is a key element of what this conference is about to convene people from different perspectives, different expertise, and then br bring together an interdisciplinary approach across those domains in order to be able to get to real solutions. I know that there's some real curiosity about the role of philanthropy, in particular private philanthropy, and how it fits in. Uh, this is something that I think is going to have great impact in the first half of the century. Let me just give you a piece of data that I'd like you all to, to have in your mind. We think about the important role that, say, the Rockefeller Foundation had with, with uh, the support for Nor Norman Borlaug and the Green Revolution. We think about the Ford Foundation, Hewlett, Packard uh, Foundations. In the first half of this century, there will be eight to ten times as much wealth and real dollars that goes into philanthropy than there was in the 20th century in total. Eight to ten times. This is something that in my role at the Rakes Foundation I'm thinking about. How do we make sure that that philanthropic wealth is spent effectively, efficiently, with great impact for society? And so the purpose of this panel was, is to give you a bit of an opportunity to understand how private philanthropy thinks about these kinds of problems, and then specifically the issues of water and water for food. So I'm very pleased to be joined by David Bergmanson. David leads a team at the Gates Foundation that explores how digital technology can be leveraged to accelerate the development and delivery of farmer-preferred products and services so that we get sustainable and equitable increase in agricultural productivity for smallholder farmers in the developing world. He also represents the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation on the Fund Council for the CGIR Consortium and will soon become the next Director General of the International Crops Research Institute for Semi-Arid Tropics, sometimes called ICRASAT. That is a CGIR center focused on demand-driven innovation to improve the resilience, productivity, and prosperity of smallholder farming in dry land tropics of Africa and South Asia. We're also joined by Raymond Guthrie. Raymond develops and structures financial investments to support the work of the Skoll Foundation and their social, social entrepreneurs, accelerating the organization's ability to address the world's most pressing problems. Raymond has dedicated his career to investing in and supporting entrepreneurs in the developing world. Prior to joining Skoll, uh, Raymond was a foreign service officer at the U.S. Agency for International Development, where he initially served as private enterprise officer within the USAID's India mission. And before his time with USAID, he worked as an investment analyst at Calvert Investments, one of the largest socially responsible investments in the world. So please join me in thanking and welcoming our panelists. Thank you. So David, Raymond, uh, I want each of you to provide you know, brief description of, of your work. Uh, Raymond, you for the Skoll Foundation, David for the Gates Foundation, and, and how you bring your expertise uh, to that work. Raymond? Sure. So I work, on, I work in the Innovation Investment Group at Skoll. What we do is we invest in the social entrepreneurs within our portfolio uh, when we have an opportunity to help drive and accelerate the impact of their innovation. So we make larger investments that we believe um, can help alongside our ecosystem partners drive the large scale change that our, our, so our foundation is looking to achieve. So in general, most of us are, are um, generalists. We don't have specific expertise. So I, whereas my colleague they, at the Gates Foundation, they have Specific, specific sectors where they invest, we focus on social entrepreneurs because we believe that social entrepreneurs are the vehicle in which we can help drive large-scale change. You, would you do, draw that as an analogy to venture capital? I mean, do you think of it as you're a venture capitalist identifying the, the great entrepreneurs, or do you see the model as different in some way? 
In some sense it is, and since we sit in Silicon Valley, I think that's a fair analogy in some ways. So we believe in the entrepreneur and having a transformative person lead an organization to be able to tackle these hard challenges. So that's who we're initially investing in. And those are the people that are winning the school award to bring them into our portfolio. The next stage is when my group comes in, and that's when there's evidence within the ecosystem of the impact of the innovation from the entrepreneur, and that there's other ecosystem actors willing to align with us to drive the large scale change. Mm -hmm. and you're familiar with some of the traditional uh, philanthropies and, and their work. I mentioned the Rockefeller Foundation. You probably have some sense of Hewlett and Packard. Do you see your investments as being a very similar type of model, the sort of grant-making model, or do you see it as very different? It's a good question. And I think one thing that distinguishes us from the other traditional foundations is the fact that we have other tools besides just grants. So my group, we can make uh, program-related grants, or program-related investments and grants to support entrepreneurs, but we also have two other groups that connect and celebrate our entrepreneurs. So we have the School World Forum, where we convene in Oxford every year, where we bring around like-minded people that are connected to try to solve these problems. So we have this ability to convene, but then we also have the ability to celebrate and spread the word. So we have innovative partnerships with people like Sundance, and publishing groups to put the message and the story of our entrepreneurs out there. So sometimes it's not necessarily the funding that comes out, but it's the movies that we put out around our entrepreneurs' message or the books around the entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. So I think in that way, we're not necessarily this uh, traditional type of investor. Mm -hmm. And another way we're not similar to other foundations is we don't solicit or put out RFPs looking for people to uh, put proposals in. Our investments are grounded in a social entrepreneur, and, those, and that's a vehicle which we think we can drive scale. Great, thank you. If, if you'll permit me to insert a little bit of an ed editorial point, one of the reasons I wanted uh, Raymond to share that is that I mentioned this large amount of wealth that's going to be coming into philanthropy in the first half of this, this century. And in particular, it's in part the confluence of the baby boomer generation with the wealth creation that occurred in high tech and in financial services. And I think the net result of that is these philanthropists will look at philanthropy very differently in many cases than, than traditional uh, philanthropy. Uh, Raymond uh, mentioned briefly, you know, participant media, Last Call, to, just say a little bit about Last Call at the Oasis. Well, I would say I should make a distinction first. Yeah. So within the Jeff School Group, there are different mechanisms in which Jeff has put his uh, money to work. And the foundation's one of them. And we're separate and apart from participant who puts out movies that are, have a social message around it. So like um, Inconvenient Truth, which I hope most people have seen before, or a new movie that's coming out soon, it's called Merchants of Doubt, that talks about the people that try to uh, drive people to not believe in climate change, essentially. Mm -hmm. But then we also have another uh, group, which is called Capcorn Investments, who manages our endowment. And they make so mission-aligned investments that would are purely commercial, but are still in line with the overall mission of us. So us three, we try to work in unison when we can. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you'll see a movie come out, but then they'll say how you can take action, and that will be work that our foundation can help drive. Great. Right. Right. And in embedded in, in Raymond's comments, he, he mentioned PRIs, or program-related investments, within the Skoll Foundation. And that also is a somewhat unique, uh, or let me say, rarely used tool but it involves, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it involves making uh, an equity or debt investment in a for-profit entity oftentimes, as long as it's for a charitable purpose, and, and we see that growing, so. Yeah. And one also ways is we also invest in investment funds, impact investment funds, that also expose us to a lot of the uh, companies that are relevant to this fund, uh, forum. Great. Great, very helpful, thank you. David, how about if you share a little bit about your areas of work and uh, the expertise you bring to it? Sure. Well, well, first, thanks, Jeff, for this opportunity and, and for the perspective of foundations to contribute to this dialogue. My background actually is in uh, corn breeding. I spent more than 15 years as a corn breeder, uh, both with Agriculture Canada and with CIMIT, uh, the Crop and uh, Maize and Wheat Crop Improvement Center, before joining the foundation. And so in 2007, I was managing many of our large crop improvement grants for maize, rice, legumes, dryland cereals. And over the course of about six years, we managed to reach more than six million farmers by 
really applying demand-driven innovation. So using participatory approaches to really hear what the farmers were asking for in the form of a new variety, and using that to drive the decision-making process of what varieties were released. Is all, it also served as a vehicle for creating awareness and demand for those varieties. Mm -hmm. uh, but then coming out of that, we realized that you know, we really need to harvest digital technology much better to target the development and delivery of those products and services to smallholder farmers. And so in uh, February of, of 2012, Bill had a speech at EFAD, and he really called for a digital revolution in agriculture, of how do we unlock the power of these technologies to serve smallholder farmers. And so for the last two and a half years, I've been focused on that, of how do we use these technologies to stitch together integrated solutions for smallholder farmers and do so in an equitable way, thinking about women, and youth, and how we can create excitement about agriculture and get youth involved and come back to agriculture. As you know, it's an aging demographic. I know yeah. I'm not pointing to you specifically, <laughs> Jeff, uh, but farming is, gray hair, is facing an aging demographic. And so who's going to produce the next generation of food? I think that's a really important question to ask. And so we've been focusing on cloud computing, mobile uh, technology, geospatial data, and genomics, especially systems biology, as we look towards the integration of not just the improvement of one crop or livestock species, but how they fit together mm -hmm. to increase the efficiency of provisioning nutritious food. Mm -hmm. Very good, very good. So I'm trying to remember how you phrased that big problem you're working on. I'm wondering, what's the answer? So, you know, the answer is actually fairly simple in concept, but hard to execute, which is, I guess, is going to be part of our conversation. If you think of this conversation, it's happening in a specific location in time. Mm -hmm. And any operation along the agricultural value chain is the same. Mm -hmm. And so by using that very simple organizing principle, we can actually deliver very tailored uh, input recommendations to smallholder farmers. We can integrate them into the marketplaces in a structured and equitable manner. Mm -hmm. And we can manage the landscape. But the challenge is the behavior around realizing that and, and the open data for agriculture and nutrition, for example, that the G8 call for is one one call for action, but implementing or executing against that call is, is a huge challenge. Yeah, absolutely. Well, l let's kind of take that, take the conversation now down to the next level and hear a little bit about where and how your organizations fund water and food security uh, solutions. And as part of that, maybe a, a, an add-on to the question, share a little bit about how you use uh, data or give some examples of database solutions that you see as having potential. David, we'll start with you. Great. Well, with the Gates Foundation, uh, more recently we've focused on Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia and actually specific countries within each of those geographies, looking at improving the productivity of smallholder farmers who earn less than the $2 a day. Yep. So, so that's our market. Um, so now looking at the portfolio to serve that market. We had a water portfolio that operated from 2008 to 2012. We invested $70.3 million, 29 of which was in Africa. And, and we were really focused on increasing the productivity potential of smallholder farmers by making access to irrigation facilities, but also data to support those decisions. Mm -hmm. And so a $9 million investment was made to the International Water and, and Management uh, uh, in Institute, mm -hmm. uh, part of the CGIR along with partners, other partners like IDE, FAO, uh, and others, to really look at watershed management, national mapping, and regional analysis of how best do we sustainably use water resources to support agriculture. So that was one example. Another big data example is supporting the CGIR to help them realize this call for open data uh, to support agriculture development. Uh, AgMIP, which is an agricultural modeling and uh, intercomparison improvement project is looking at how do we bring this data to s sort out the yield gap, and, and, and Ken Kasman is going to be talking more about that later. Harvest Choice was another big data investment where we wanted to bring together the publicly available data and make them more widely uh, accessible to development partners. You mentioned AFSIS already, mm -hmm. the African Soil Information Service, where we were one of the investors in that. But we've also been looking at, for example, the downscaling of weather data. We mentioned that's a big constraint. Mm -hmm. And, and we need some immediate solutions. Rather than waiting for the perfect solution, we actually, through uh, remote sensing technology, especially radar 
uh, satellite imagery, can downscale rain, rainfall data even for Africa where we have a scarcity of terrestrial weather stations. So those are the kinds of investments. You, you mentioned though, what's the unique role of foundations? And I think uh, using the voice of the foundation is very important, especially with someone like uh, Bill and Melinda Gates. And so the, the G8 call for open data back in April of 20, uh, or 2013 was an opportunity for us to use that voice to, to be a part of that movement, which translated into the Global Open Data for Agriculture and Nutrition initiative that now has 120 partner organizations committed to realizing that vision. But again, it's going to come down to the nuts and bolts of, of executing that. So great. Well, thanks for sharing that. Raymond, same question for you. What areas of water and water for food or food security solutions are you looking at, investing in, and you know, where do you see some examples of innovative database solutions? Right, so I think it's a good juxtaposition because our foundation doesn't necessarily go about this the same way as the Gates Foundation. We don't take a sector or take a region and then look for a portfolio. We, our investments stem and start from our social entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. So we have, I, I'd, I'd rather just give two examples of two social entrepreneurs that we support that are relevant to this. Great. So one of them is called uh, Water for People. And so what Water for People does is work with local uh, NGOs and local governments around uh, water and sanitation solutions, but in a sustainable and entrepreneurial way. And relevant to this is a, a innovation that they have called Flow, which is like, it's their ability to monitor um, at, at real time water, point, water points and to ensure that water is being served clean, um, sustainably and cleanly. And so they cover about, I think it's around 2 million people now and about 7,000 water points all throughout. And they use mobile technology and geomapping to collect together to be able to provide this service. Mm -hmm. Another example of an organization that we work with that's relevant to this is um, a group called One Acre Fund. It's so a One Acre Fund works with subsistence farmers or smallholder farmers in primarily East Africa. And what they've been able to do is partner with a local governments on a national scale to help improve their own systems to, to better serve these smallholder farmers. And that's all, and all the work that they work with the governments is driven by their own data. So they spend years working with smallholder farmers, finding out what helps to lead to better adapt adaption, helps to lead to better crop real and, and ultimately higher income, and mm -hmm. then uses those technologies and innovations and helps and convinces the governments in these local African countries to go to utilize those innovations. So what we see is social entrepreneurs driving this type of large-scale change or e equilibrium change by disseminating their innovations through some of the largest uh, distributors, which in our case is the government. Mm -hmm. So we have social entrepreneurs in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and Asia where they're relevant water and uh, food security investments. And one of the things you mentioned, Raymond, is the, uh, the, the approach that you take of, of uh, really your investments are in those social entrepreneurs. There's a lot of people here in, in the audience that are probably thinking, you know, I'm part of a multilateral institution or I'm part of uh, an academic institution and they're wondering if you make investments in those kinds of opportunities or partnerships or if that's just something that's out of scope for the Skoll Foundation. That's really important for us actually. So when we invest in an entrepreneur and we invest in our innovation it's important to understand who the relevant ecosystem actors are. So part of my job is, is interacting with these multilateral, bilateral organizations and figuring out what their take is on the problem and whether or not our entrepreneur can actually work with them to drive this scale, large scale change. Because we don't believe that our foundation can, and our social entrepreneur alone can, can make this impact. So it's a, it's a coalition or a, a group of us together that we can work. So we wouldn't necessarily fund an organization that's a research group, but we would work in partnership and help a fund the coalition perhaps with our social entrepreneur. Great, very good. I want to, uh, I should emphasize that this is intended to be a dialogue with the audience and so uh, there are a couple of microphones. I'm going to encourage you to, to go to the microphones. I'll be watching for them and I'll kind of start flipping back and forth between my own questions of the panelists and and the audience. And there was a gentleman who moved very quickly <laughs> to <laughs> microphone number one. So okay, yes. I'm excited to hear what question you have. Okay, Jeff, thank you. Uh, my name is Albert Janssen from uh, chairman of the Waterwatch Foundation, co-founder of ELEAF. I have a question for David and for Raymond. Uh, for Damon, the question is uh, talking about uh, philanthropy. Uh, how do you look to your business cases? Uh, because we think that if we really want to uh, change in a very substantial way, 
then the business model should be very profitable and then you really can implement new changes for the whole world and build the de facto standards. How, how do you think as Gates Foundation to support that concept within your, uh, within your way of thinking? And for Raymond, is well, why don't you hold on that? Let's let David answer that question, and then we'll we'll dive in because I may have a follow-on too. Go ahead, David. Yeah. So the business model, you know, we're looking for sustainable and equitable solutions, and that means tying farmers to equitable markets. And and as we look at demand-driven innovation and what we invest against, we're looking at how do we not just increase productivity, but how do we increase profitability of smallholder farmers to l help them lift themselves out of poverty. So we are looking at public-private partnerships, not just in technology development, but also in market integration. Okay. Okay. So you, you, you support my concept that business is a tool? Yeah. If we're looking at scale and sustainability, we have to yeah. be looking at this. Okay. For yeah. And, and if I could just add on there, uh, when I commented earlier to the gentleman's question about where we invest, I, I highlighted this notion of catalytic philanthropy, at least as the Gates Foundation defines it. as an opportunity to try and identify innovative solutions that uh, wouldn't get developed without private philanthropy dollars, but then once they are developed, they need to be scaled up and sustained by the public sector or private sector. And that means you absolutely have to have in mind what is a sustainability model, whether it's an economic system or whether it's some allocation of, of public sector. Funding, would you agree? Uh, yes, I agree. Great. Then let's now go to the Raymond's okay, Raymond, question. Okay, second question for Raymond. Uh, I'm, I'm not a scientist. I'm not academic. I'm just a businessman doing uh, good things over that in the social enterprise. What are your main criteria for investing in a social enterprise? And I'm very interested in, because you're also a kind of venture capital organization, what are your profitability criteria? So your question is, what's our main criteria? Yeah, and what is the main criteria with regard to profitability? Yeah, so it, it, sort of how, how do you go about picking a, a, a social entrepreneur? What are those characteristics? And Okay, so we aren't an early stage investor by any, any stretch of the imagination. We look, generally um, look for social entrepreneurs that are in the mezzanine stage. So they have some evidence, or there is evidence of, of the entrepreneur driving impact. And they're generally between one to four million dollars of earned revenue before we'd make our initial um, an, our investment or grant. Um, but because we're an evidence-based organization, it all stems and starts with the fact that there is evidence that the innovation or the approach of the entrepreneur is actually driving real impact. But then there's also a, an era of a means of which there is sustainability, either through earned revenue or a pathway to public resources. So th those are the two primary, that's where it starts, and then it all depends on which sector we're in before we, uh, before we make another investment. And do you have certain objectives with regard to profitability, how much percentage that should achieve? No, we don't have hard and fast. It's not hard and fast. But it all stems from the social entrepreneur having a vision for driving, driving this, this equilibrium change that's outside of just one county or one district, but how can you fix an uns unsatisfactory equilibrium and in, in means of, and I'm saying as if like, uh, how do you enable smallholder farmers to drive or to increase their income? And it's gotta be something outside of just the organization and outside of just that person and the means to get there is what we look for. Okay, thank you. Super, thank you very much. I'm gonna pick up on the gentleman's question uh, and Raymond and ask a little bit about how, you know, how do you define what it means for a program to scale or to, to achieve scale? And then what types of data or evidence are you looking for uh, for those, those social entrepreneurs and their programs on that? Right. So for us, large scale change is when, with an entrepreneurial approach, you are able to fix an unjust or unsatisfactory equilibrium mm -hmm. and create a new sustainable one, which is um, maintained long after, long after our, our investment. So that means, getting to a point where people are being served when they weren't being able to serve before. It could be either like large scale imitation or uh, adaptation of an approach. It could be the coalition of other funders moving in, moving in to support that entrepreneur. But it's, we don't see large scale change and scale being driven by ourselves. It's us helping that entrepreneur get to the point where others can coalesce and support it. Great, thanks. Sir. 
Uh, I'm uh, Colin Chartris. I was the uh, Director General of IMI when we uh, got that uh, money from the Gates Foundation for the Agricultural Water Management Project, for which we were very, very grateful, and I think it delivered some great results. And I was somewhat then uh, disappointed uh, in 2012 when Gates pulled out of water funding uh, per se in agriculture. My, my question is, uh, as we move forward, and we've heard in this meeting and at the World Food Prize the other day, the, the fact that sustainable intensification of agriculture is going to be, particularly for smallholders, is going to be one of the critical solutions we've got to push towards. And that's going to be looking at sort of total factor productivity, which brings in everything, all inputs from, from water and natural resources through to seed uh, and so on. And I just wanted to get a feel from David about what is the Gates uh, Foundation's philosophy going to be about how they sort of look at projects and that, that ilk? And is there an opportunity there for people involved in water for food linking and partnering with others to come into that kind of project? Great question. Uh, so in our last strategy, we, we had, had real pressure to focus. And, and one of the areas we decided that we could um, contribute to but really not lead was in this area of, of water. Uh, we felt that uh, we could really lead in the area of crop and livestock improvement, vaccine development, but with the resources, even though we have a lot of resources, they're still finite and we had to focus on those and thinking that water uh, was really an area around policy and investment by governments to provide the enabling environment and infrastructure to realize the productivity associated with, with irrigation uh, systems. It's not to say that it wasn't important, and we continue to make investments in the area of sustainable intensification through projects like the Serial System Initiative for South Asia, where we're looking at water as one component of an integrated crop production system. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we haven't you know, completely abandoned investments in water, but looking at it from a more integrated investment approach. Thank you. And, I, and I'll just add to that. I, I think one of the things you're going to find with private philanthropy is that in order to have an impact, they're going to pick areas and, and, and focus. That doesn't necessarily mean that the areas they don't invest in aren't important. Uh, in fact, whether it's US K through 12 education reform, where some people work on teacher effectiveness in the classroom and others will work on, on leadership in the school system. It's going to be important for these things to be partnerships. And so just because you know, the Gates Foundation can't do everything, uh, it's got to be very thoughtful and, and I completely uh, respect that. Similarly, I think Raymond would probably say the, the, the same thing. Raymond, I want to come back to you. You heard David and I talk a little bit about how we thought, we think of catalytic philanthropy uh, but I think it's a, a term that probably can be defined in different ways. So I'm wondering if you have a definition of, of catalytic philanthropy or, or do you see that concept as relevant in your work? Yeah, so I, I would say we view our investments generally as catalytic in nature, but it's not the same sense that people would think generally in terms of we're not taking early stage risks. We're, like I said, a mezzanine type of investor. Mm -hmm. So we're, and like earlier your point about we can't be everything to everybody, I think we try to really much, really focus on the mezzanine level of, in terms of entrepreneurs. So, but we believe our investments helping these entrepreneurs get to this point where they could help drive large scale change and that's what we think is catalytic. Because there's only, only way you can drive real impact is if there's actually some type of catalyt catalytic mm -hmm. event happening. Mm -hmm. um, so, th so de generally, that's where we are. I, one point I like to make, though, about partnerships that I forgot to point yeah. out is that we do partner with bilaterals. So we have a, about a $45 million partnership with USAID to right. collectively yep. co-invest in social entrepreneurs with US, through USAID's pipeline and then also through ours. So we are open and interested in partnering with other bilaterals and other organizations. And then some of, a lot of our social entrepreneurs also partner with research organizations and institutions as well. So I think the best way for someone to ever partner with us would be probably through our social entrepreneurs or through, if it's a bilateral, through, through with our organization. And, and coming back to this point you made about catalytic philanthropy, are there, are there a set of 
questions or, there are, yes. or is there some evidence that you're looking for yes. uh, in order to meet the test of what you view as a catalytic philanthropy opportunity? Absolutely. So it always starts with the, the entrepreneur and the opportunity that arises. But then we, we develop our own investment thesis for how we could actually drive this, how our investment can drive this, this impact. But then it, it goes to our research around the ecosystem and whether there is actually some data and evidence around whether or not what our entrepreneur is doing is being taken up by the ecosystem and whether there are actor, actually actors who are interested or supportive of that entrepreneur or that innovation. Mm -hmm. But then it comes back to our own tool set and trying to figure mm -hmm. out what we can actually do to invest. So it could be money, mm -hmm. it could be through convening through the World Forum, or it could be through putting out a movie that, that helps uh, signify or spread the message about it. Mm -hmm. So our catalyt catalytic investments can be a, lot, a bevy of different things and we try not to look at it just through the lens of money. Right. But it's all dependent upon whether or not the ecosystem and other actors are also aligned with us. Mm -hmm. Great, very good. One of the, the, I want to ask each of you a little bit about how you use data or evidence along the path. Now, one of the most important things I learned uh, by working with Frank Reisberman at the Gates Foundation was a concept that I think uh, Frank coined called outcome investing. And the way in which I see it is, is that uh, much like, you know, military, they say no battle plan survives first contact with the enemy. Absolutely. My experience in business was that no business plan survived first contact with the, mar the marketplace. And then when I got to the Gates Foundation, I found out that no grant or, or grant strategy survived first contact with its intended beneficiaries. Yet, I found the structure to be quite rigid. And, you know, we had this grant laid out, it was five years, and people just kind of marched down the path, even though I think sometimes they got data to the contrary. This is a long way of saying that one of the things that I admired about Frank's work at the, the Gates Foundation was a concept called outcome investing, and the way I tuned it a little bit uh, to say, let's focus in on what outcome we want to achieve and be less prescriptive about all the steps along the way. The intent is to be able to use data and evidence. Let's talk a little bit about how you go about that in each of your uh, organizations. How do you use data, evidence, to adjust along the path? I want to start. So Great. I could start first by saying at a portfolio level, to, we're developing a means in which we could mine data to find trends and, uh, within our own portfolio for how our entrepreneurs are operating. Mm -hmm. And then from an investment standpoint, we structure, well, at least my investments are structured around milestones and they're more along the lines of outcomes and we're less prescriptive on the means of which to get to those outcomes, but we set specific targets. And so if we set an investment for five years, we are constantly gathering data uh, points along the way to see how we are getting towards that means. And if we receive more information that says that we're veering off course, then we are very flexible in terms of fixing our investment or, fix, or adjusting our grant so that we can help support the entrepreneur to get to the ultimate end goal. Mm -hmm. um, and then I should also say, before we would ever make an investment, there has to be hard data around the fact that what our entrepreneur is asking us to support is actually has gotten momentum thus far, and it's driving impact. And so a lot of the ways we get to that is independent sources, third party, third party investors that have already supported them, governments a lot of times, so we align our investments with the governments and what they're looking for, and then sometimes it's uh, third party evaluators as well. So data and evidence is very much rooted in the way we justify and prescribe our money and, and support social entrepreneurs. I'm going to come back to you on a question with failure, but I, about failure. But I want to ask the, just remind the audience, uh, you know, feel free to proceed to the microphone. We're glad to entertain uh, your, your questions. Actually, I'll hold my question for now. Go ahead, please. Sure. Hi, I'm Conrad Weaver. I'm an independent film producer and producing a documentary called Thirsty Land. I noticed on your website that you don't fund independent projects, but yet you talk about working with films and creating films. So could you explain that a little bit, how, how you do that? Right, that's why I was trying to uh, point out <laughs> earlier that within the Jeff School group, there are different elements. And so participant media is separate and apart from us. So we, we, work, we work in unison in terms of messaging and alignment of mission, but the, the, film, the supporting of films, we actually are supporting them through our partnership with Sundance and then participant makes their own decisions separately from us. So the way we work with, in, with filming would be through our social entrepreneurs and supporting projects around them most likely, not generally supporting a, a video about an issue specifically. Does that, does that answer your question? Yep. All right, thank you. No problem. 
So I want to come back to, to the question about adjustment along the way, data and evidence. Uh, in venture capital, typically they'd say, well, you'll get two or three ventures that return money, one that's a hit, six or seven that are absolute duds and get shut down. How often do you shut down uh, an investment in your social entrepreneurs and is your success failure ratio similar to what we see in private sector venture capital or very different? So that's one thing we struggle with right now because there aren't the market forces that you would have in venture capital. They're, or NGOs don't fail necessarily. They're, they're, and so there's sometimes problems within even the market of NGOs that are performing or putting forward solutions that aren't necessarily the best means, but because they continue to get grants, they continue to distort the market. Now, for our standpoint, failure isn't a bad thing. We're started by an entrepreneur. We sit in Silicon Valley. So we don't, we don't view failure, we only view something as failing as if we don't, we see the data and we don't adjust or write, ship, or write the ship. It's, I laugh because I just ended up um, ending the last tranche of an investment that we had because of the data was showing that the entrepreneur wasn't achieving the milestones and only we had a la one year left and it was clear that they weren't going to. So we had an amicable solution where we stopped the funding and just counted, our, counted what happened and then take those, those learnings for our next, next investment. Um, our success to failure ratio, I think it's a little too early right now for our, to give you a, a good ballpark number, but we're probably on the. We're probably doing a little better than when I was in, investing as a. <laughs> just because of we we take less risk than a traditional invest, venture capital fund would. Great, great, very good. Thank you, you know, David. You know we hear a lot about the potential for big data to be the next big revolution in agriculture, and you've been a great spokesperson for that. You mentioned how you helped orchestrate the session with Bill Gates. I think it was in April, of of 2012. 12. You heard earlier in uh, some of the questions I got from the audience, there's a lot of interest in, you know, how do you really embrace smallholder farmers as part of this equation? One of the gentlemen asked, you know, or is it gonna be a system of just data collectors that are separate from, from data users? So I'd like you to share in your vision, how do you see the role of smallholder small farmers being able to really take advantage of of, of the big data or data analytics? I, I think there's a few avenues here. You know, one is just the, the push model. So, for example, it was mentioned by Frank, you know, SMS messaging for, for, for weather, you know, that's, that's a push. But the models that I'm seeing now that are showing real promise is where big data is used to support farmers make business decisions on their farm through service providers, the private sector. And uh, this is, uh, I think where we need to move towards because it's not just recommending farmers how to increase their productivity, is helping them actually integrate into the marketplace and realizing the value of that surplus production. And actors that can support them along that value chain I think are going to provide a very valuable service and farmers will get value back for the data they provide on their farm. And I think that's the kind of partnerships that are going to lead to success. I mean, it does touch on the issues of personal identification information and data governance and a whole host of other issues, but that business model is the one that I think holds a lot of promise in making agriculture a commercial enterprise, even for smallholder farmers. I want to, I want to dig into that last point. Uh, and again, if we're about seven, eight minutes left, so if you have questions, please pr proceed to the microphone. You know, we've seen a lot of issues uh, surrounding concerns that this big data, this interconnected, internet-based big data world, world leads to issues of trust, mm -hmm. uh, concerns about privacy. And I'm wondering how you're thinking about that. I mean, do you, do you worry that we could end up in a situation where uh, farmers or smallholder farmers are not cooperative with uh, uh, the opportunity to supply uh, data because they fear trust, they fear government action against them or something, or is that really a non-issue? I, I think it is an is issue. I mean, farming, as a farmer, you really rely on trust. You rely on trusted relationships to give you advice. Uh, you rely on trust when you buy seed of a, of a new variety. So it is an industry of trust, and we don't want to compromise that trust by not managing personal information of farmers to where it's exploited against the 
goals or a, a vision of the smallholder farmer. So we do need to be thoughtful around how data is managed and used in a secure, uh, equitable manner that delivers value back to the smallholder farmer. It's, it's, very, it's a very complex topic, the issue of data governance, and that whole field is shifting more from away, away from strict permissions and, and really moving towards uh, thinking through principles and values to guide our behavior and how that data is used to support the farming industry and especially smallholder farmers. Very good. Thank you. I recognize that gentleman at the microphone, Bashir. Introduce yourself and your question. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Uh, my name is Bashir Jama, and I work with the AGRA, the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa and Biz Nairobi. Uh, my question goes to uh, Raymond. Um, it's about uh, the accessibility of the data that uh, your social entrepreneurs generate. Uh, and the question is how accessible is that uh, to, to the public and, and to others who um, want to use or modify, use that data to make certain decisions? I ask that because you emphasized uh, a bit uh, on the link with public sector. Yep. Is that data private? No, actually, it's the opposite. So because we're not, we're not like I was before a venture capitalist and worried about our entrepreneur or company holding on to the information, we actually look for the dissemination and copycats or imitation of our entrepreneurs. So we want the information to be public. And in some cases, we've actually funded so that the, we could allow the information to be public and help people figure out ways to work with our social entrepreneurs. So I can give you a quick example. We have an organization that uh, we support through our endowment called Planet Labs that um, takes satellite imaging of almost everywhere in the world on a real-time basis. And we're, we're funding a way for the NGOs to utilize that data and that information for their projects. So the short answer is no, the pro information isn't private. And the long answer is we look for ways to help try to enable others to utilize the data that our social entrepreneurs have. Great, super. Bashir, thank you. Raymond, thank you. Uh, last question from the audience, and then we're going to wrap. Thank you, uh, Pasquale, Pasquale Steduto, always from FAO. Uh, I was noticing that, uh, you know, in the different uh, foundations, there is this issue of sustainability, added value, niche, where, where to really have the highest impact, and so on. So I was wondering, there are so many foundation. Is there a mechanism of coordination that, that also among the foundation that can be a, a sort of synergic way of uh, action and, and have an impact, coordinated impact in the ground? I'm saying this because also in the conventional, um, you know, donor uh, system from the conventional country that are donating money, generally for a, a, there is a, a transition going on as much as possible to coordinate for a specific maybe a country to get together and see how to better put the funds in a way that has a higher impact. So I was just wondering if is something there that is going on in the, in the field of foundation that coordinate among themselves. So. So I, I used to work in the, uh, for a bilateral, and I, I hear these stories about different funders working together, and I worry that you add bureaucracy onto things. So I think it's important to be aware of where everyone's working, but I worry if you try to get too many foundations collectively working together, then you have their boards, their boards having to make decisions and the, the collective body having to make a decision, and then all of a sudden you, you get a lot more bureaucracy and you lose a nimbleness that where it could take us six months to make a decision and write a large check, it could turn into a year and a half. Not to say that we shouldn't all work together, but I sometimes get a little fearsome when we talk about all of us working together in one big pool of money. Or so, so one organizing framework for this is along value chains and, and within commodities within a country and using an organizing framework for coordination without having uh, the risk of bureaucracy uh, of coordination. So. You know, this is where we're looking at national mapping and making sure that we're all on, the, if you will, the same map or page when it comes to investments within a country. And there's a lot of appetite for this topic right now because we all are investing in geospatial data, but it's not being organized in, in, in concert amongst donors, including the World Bank, which is a big investor in this space. So uh, 
we hear you and, and agree that there's a need for coordination, but we need to have uh, the geospatial assets and the sharing of that information to s facilitate coordination without um, the impedance of bureaucracy to execute. I'm going to add a provocative comment. <laughs> I, I think the, the Raymond and David's view are absolutely correct. They're both correct. I also want to interject one point just about the challenge of private philanthropy. To some extent, private philanthropy is driven by the passion of the philanthropist or the organization that they, they represent. And it's been my experience, as much as I'd love to see greater collaboration, you not only have the risk of bureaucracy, but you also have the, cha the structural challenge that the philanthropists or the organization want credit for what they do. And so, therefore, it causes them to say, I, you know, I find this sometimes, well, if the Gates Foundation is doing it, I don't want to do it, I want to do my own thing, and so on and so forth. And, you know, unlike very ultra-competitive high-tech, you know, you don't have the market forces that force partnerships, integration, acquisitions, mergers. You know, private philanthropy can exist for a long time without working together, and I think this is one of the challenges. But I just want to lay it out there so you know what, what uh, I think the situation is. So, on a more positive note, uh, what words of advice would you give to researchers and organizations interested in collaborating uh, with you? For, with, for us, I would first go to our website and see the different social entrepreneurs in the areas where they focus on, and then try to reach out to them first and see if there's areas where that you guys could provide them with the, the information and data that you have. I think most of our entrepreneurs are always eager to find people that have the skills and the resources and the expertise that your people in this audience have. Um, secondly, if you're a multilateral or bilateral funder, we're always interested in, um, and curious to expand our, our network of partnerships. But I, would, I should also say that we don't solicit, uh, we don't fund just regular research projects or, or we, it all starts with our social entrepreneurs. So I'm not gonna, I can't fund you guys if just, just because you have a great idea. Sorry. <laughs> Although I want to, it feels up to me. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks, Raymond. David. Well, I, as I mentioned earlier, we do have a strategy, so go to the website and see what that strategy is. But it's focused on uh, commodities that are staple crops for uh, smallholder farmers and consumers in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, as well as livestock value chains that uh, are going to have huge potential in the future, and so we're investing against that. As far as different modalities for partnership, uh, we do have requests for proposals through grand challenges and other vehicles for bringing together the best innovators to solve these most challenging problems. Uh, we tend to be more intentional, though, about selecting partners based on our strategy. So we go out and actually work with the partners in developing grants to achieve our shared goals. But then we also have other vehicles. It was mentioned PRIs. You know, that's another instrument that we have available. I think, you know, for us the big opportunity and challenge is how do we stitch it all together? Here we're focusing on water and agriculture, but it impacts obviously on, on health, education, um, and so when we look at broad-based economic development in a sustainable and equitable manner, we, we need to be starting to think about how do we use big data to integrate these different domains that all of them in their own right are important for development. So I think that's our big challenge and opportunity in philanthropy is how do we make that happen. Raymond, David, you were terrific. I, certainly from my perspective, you really achieved the goal of bringing two pretty diverse approaches to philanthropy, but both very successful. And I think if we had two or three other philanthropists here, we'd find two or three more uh, approaches. But it really helps the audience to, to get a sense of where philanthropy uh, can fit in. And I, I hope you'll all agree with my closing comments on the value that they provided and thank our panelists for their their contribution. Thank you.